Thank you for having me here today. This is very exciting. Um, I'm going to start off with a provocative statement. It's going to be about selfies. It's what I've been studying for the past year. So here's my statement. Selfies aren't fake. This comes up a lot in my classes when we talk about selfies. Students will say things to me, and this isn't actually the voice of a student, this is like TV student voice. They'll say things to me like, uh, selfies are like so fake. Like there's this girl I know who takes selfies all the time, and she's like, she looks so good in her selfies, but I mean, that's not what she really looks like. <laughs> so the moment of genius I'm going to talk about today, I have a lot of selfies of myself up here. Um, the moment of genius I'm going to talk about today is a moment of genius that came from talking to a whole bunch of girls this summer who take a lot of selfies. And what I learned from these girls, these girls who are, I want to call them plugged in girls, they're girls who uh, connect with Tumblr and Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook every 15 to 20 minutes. In the lives of these hyper-mediated girls, I'm going to propose that selfies are perhaps the most authentic version of a girl that exists in visual culture today. So I'm going to start off today's talk with two lessons that I've learned from my research so far. The first lesson is that cameras are super powerful tools. And the second lesson is that images are very persuasive. And once I establish those, then I hope that that sort of sets a foundation for understanding my standpoint, which is that selfies are authentic. So let's start with my first lesson. My first lesson is that cameras are super powerful tools. Now, starting from about the age of nine and continuing on through high school, I learned this from these weekly dinner parties that I would attend, our family would attend, at my uncle's house. Uh, and this uncle owned a video camera, and this was the 80s, so the video camera he owned was a video camera from the 80s. Now, if you were, lived a privileged enough existence to have encountered one of these video cameras from the 80s, you'll know what I'm talking about. They look nothing like those micro sandwich bun sized versions of a video camera you have now. Rather, they were these monstrous shoulder mounted monstrosities with this shiny robotic eye that my uncle would like heave onto his shoulder and then he'd lumber around the house recording the events of the evening. And I remember, you know, if you were to look back at the video footage that he would, he, uh, would have uh, recorded during those evenings, and you know we still do that for nostalgia sometimes. What you would see is you'd see my cousins who grew up on the camera, right? And they would be like, "Hey, daddy! Hi, daddy! Look at me do a cartwheel!" And you know they would like be performing. And then the camera would slowly pan to my brother and I, and we would have one of two expressions. It would either be this, or it would be this one. And I feel like those two expressions really embodied what I was both feeling and thinking uh, in that moment. <laughs> what I was feeling was fear, total and absolute fear. And what I was thinking was, I can see myself reflected on the screen of that video camera, which means I can see myself seeing myself being recorded. And that felt totally existentially weird. Susan Sontag, in her book on photography, talks about this idea. She says, the camera performs this sort of inherent violence and theft on the subjects that are placed in front of the camera. She says, think of the language we use to talk about photography. We shoot images. We take photos as if holding that visual technology, we act as these sort of visual thieves. When it comes to cameras, the, camera is the, the power is behind the camera, and the subject in front of the camera is placed in a position of vulnerability and exposition. Cameras are very powerful tools. 
The second lesson I want to share with you today is that images are very persuasive. And they're persuasive because they play in the realm of the representation of reality. I remember learning this <laughs> from many years of watching, spending Friday nights, watching movies with my parents, specifically watching movies with my mom. Now, when you watch a movie with my mom, 50% of the entertainment comes from actually watching the movie, and 50% of the entertainment comes from watching my mom watch the movie. So say we'd be watching a movie like Titanic, right? And, uh, you know, at the end of the movie, this isn't a spoiler alert if you didn't know that the Titanic sunk. <laughs> Then it did, okay? So you would be watching like Titanic, right? And there's this, you know, scene at the end. This is it up here. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet are in the water. She's up out of the water on this piece of driftwood. And Leonardo DiCaprio is majority in the water and he's sort of like perched on the edge. And this would be my mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't look so good. Uh, yeah, his lips are looking a little bit blue. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think this is, this is good. You know, what she should do, look, honey, what you should do is just move over. There's plenty of room on that piece of wood, right? You could just like heave them out. you all be good. It's all good. Oh, you know, I, I think you might go under. I think he's going to go, he's going to go under. He's, he's going to go under. There it is. He's going under. He's under. So <laughs> my takeaway from this sort of memory was that movies and photography and TV and visual culture in general is powerful and affecting. It affects us because it plays in the realm of the representation of reality and therefore what we deem to be truth. Now words also play in the realm of the representation of reality, right? But words quite obviously are stand-ins for reality. They're these curvy symbols that represent something out there. But words look nothing like the reality that exists out there, right? The letters C, A, T bear no physical resemblance to this four-legged fluffy thing that exists out there in the world. Words by their very nature remind us of the subjectivity of copies, okay? Images are different. Images look so very much like the reality that we see with our own eyes, that we trust them more. Furthermore, we prioritize the eye above any other sense. We don't say, when I hear it, I'll believe it. We say, when I see it, I'll believe it. Images are very persuasive because they play in that representation, in the space of the representation of reality. We trust images a lot. We're reminded of this when we see paintings like this one by Rene Marguerite, right? That even though images represent reality, we have to be wary of them, right? This painting says, this is not a pipe. You can't smoke this thing. This is an image of a pipe. It's a painting. Magritte says, don't be fooled. Images can be deceiving. A camera is a framing tool. It crops out the sky here. It crops out a tree here. It crops out a person here. And it crops out the ground from below. Images are very persuasive. So this brings me to my third point, which is that uh, selfies can be authentic. Now before I get into that argument, I feel like I have to talk about the term authenticity, okay? When I say authenticity, I'm not talking about what is real or what is factual. However, those terms are problematically often associated with the word authenticity. The word authenticity, etymologically, comes from the Greek word authentikos, which means original, genuine, or principal. 
It also comes from the term authentes, which means of one's own authority. It also is a combination of the terms otos, meaning self, and hentes, meaning doer. So authenticity is less about objectivity and more about control and agency and one's ability or right to be an author. Let's go back to photos for a second. What I'm saying is that images can be authentic, but they can't be objective. Objectivity presumes that something can exist beyond an individual's biases. An image is always produced by someone, meaning is it is, it's always filtered through someone's biases, meaning an image cannot be objective. But an image can be authentic because an image is always authored by someone. It's always someone's authentic version of reality. And here's the thing about how lenses and the lenses of photography and film and TV and visual culture have been controlled historically. They've been in very similar ways, meaning they have authenticated subjects that exist out there in the world in very similar ways. By presenting subjects the same way again and again, this establishes what's called filmic and photographic conventions. And filmic and photographic conventions, which we also call tropes, they tend to stick. Photographers present the world out there, they present subjects the same way as do, as do movie makers, as do TV producers. And on top of that, after a while, we as the audience learn this visual grammar and we learn to expect to see subjects presented to us in that same way. For instance, superheroes are always presented the same way to us. They're presented fists on hips, looking yonder to the people or the land they're about to save. And they're shot from below. And that from below shot, repeated again and again, comes to mean strength and power. And I'd even go so far as to say, problematically, virility and masculinity. And I could go off on how visual culture historically has reinforced gender boxes, but I'll save that for a minute. The same thing goes for girls. When I was young, I would flip through magazines, and I would watch movies, and I would learn these conventions. And I would hair flick, and I would eyelash flutter, and I would head tilt, just as I had learned from these various media outlets. But for me, the media was always up here, and I was down here separate from it. I was allowed to see these conventions and tropes. I was deeply obliged to reenact them in my everyday life. But as much as I tried, I couldn't crack through the TV screens. I couldn't dive into the glossy pages of fashion magazines and be a part of media. In 2010, however, something awesome happened. It was a combination of some technological advances the development of some cell phone apps, and the result of a cohort of very creative people that led to the rise of a digital phenomenon called the selfie. Um, and at that moment, the previous lines that had delineated producer from audience, tech from body, celebrity from everyday person sort of collapsed inward in terms of photography. A selfie is a mirror, and a camera, and a billboard, all at once. And I want to tell you the difference between how girls engage with media now that is different from what I experienced. When I was young, there was a clear separation between media and my everyday life. Now, girls are producing media. They are making media. 
They are in media. And I'd even go so far as to say they are media. With selfies, girls still do the same thing that I did when I was young. They play with photographic conventions and tropes. There's lots of these upper angle shots, a frustrating visual convention that places the camera in a position of authority and the girl in a diminutive position. There's lots of belfies, new word today, the over-the-shoulder butt selfie, um, which interestingly has a very long established convention within visual culture, dating back into European art. I'm not joking. And it's been repeated in film, most, most often in French New Wave film, and even back into Greek mythology. It connotes this notion of the temptress. But here's the cool part. When girls uh, that I spoke to play with these tropes and conventions, um, some girls said that these tropes work for their body, as if they're putting on a t-shirt, and they say, ah, oh, this works. But some of the girls said, these tropes totally fail. Whereas I had learned to see myself, we could say, photographically. I'd been trained to see myself as these lenses of visual culture had taught me, and then enact these tropes in everyday life. Girls nowadays, and this is what the selfie permits, the selfie permits girls to see themselves seeing themselves photographically. I hope I haven't lost you with that idea. I'll explain what I mean. Theorists like Irving Goffman and Judith Butler proposed that and explored this idea that gender is a sort of performance that we uh, enact, sometimes willingly, often not, uh, in everyday life to fulfill our, to fulfill our prescribed roles. I'm going to use this idea as a starting point. So if performance, then a selfie permits you to at once be an actor and also be part of the audience. You act in front of the camera, taking pictures, taking pictures, and then you get to sit back and reflect on these images and curate them. You get to assess your performance. And you know what happens when the girls I spoke to do this? They confessed about how odd it feels looking at themselves enacting these tropes and conventions. Uh, that these tropes and conventions that have been authored by someone apart from themselves. This process of reflexivity that's inherent in the process of selfie taking gives the selfie producer insight into these tropes and conventions from visual culture. When they see themselves adopting these tropes, some girls will say they like it, for it's all they've kind of ever known, right? And perhaps there's a comfort there. Just like Donna Haraway ironically proposed in the Cyborg Manifesto, women have always been mediated. We've always been cyborgs. We've always been mediated on screens, on TV sets and movies, on painting canvases. We've always been part media and part flesh part technology, and part body. So some girls say that they find comfort in this, but some girls said that this process of enacting tropes feels inauthentic and fake. And they're right, going back to that definition of authenticity, because they didn't authenticate these tropes and conventions and poses. These poses aren't original, and they're not of their own making. They're copying these tropes and conventions that were created by someone else somewhere else. And you know what they told me that they seek when they see that? They said that they seek authenticity. They seek to be authors of their own image. They seek to be originators of those pictures. Now, when girls said that they seek an authentic image, what they're describing is still something that falls within Western standards of photographic beauty, right? They'll say things like, I'm looking for good lighting, good composition, I want my hair to look nice, I want my makeup to look good. But there's also this intangible element that they seek that defines the perfect image. And it comes from this affecting and emotional place within them. They're looking for something that is felt 
and experienced, owned, and embodied. I'll watch them take these images, and they'll delete, delete, delete as they're curating them. And then they'll come across one, and they just know it immediately. And they'll say, that's it, that's the one. I got it, it's golden. And I'll ask, how do you know? And they'll say, I can't put my finger on it. It just feels right. It feels like how I see myself to be. Once the I determines that the image fits within the learned conventions of, uh, of photographic standards, then the I also seeks a connection to the image from within themselves. They seek a connection that marks the difference between a photo that simply copies the contours of a body and an image that captures a smidgen of an essence of who that girl feels herself to be. The perfect image is one that is both authentic to the eye and authentic to the girl's sense of self. In 1976, Hélène Sixou wrote a paper called The Laugh of Medusa, and in it she called on women to take hold of pens and produce more women's writing. She said, we need to do this because writing and language is inherently masculine and disembodied, and women write and speak and communicate differently. She said they speak wholly and they write sensually. They communicate with their bodies. And she said, by taking control of these pens, we are authenticating ourselves through that ink onto paper, and in essence, we are writing ourselves into being. I'd like to suggest the same thing, but with digital photography and images, and visual culture more broadly. Give a woman a camera, and give her the ability to broadcast these images widely, and she will throw her body onto these screens. And facing those screens, she will see written on her hair and on her skin and on her face the stage faces of women past. And reflecting on those moments, she might find home. And reflecting on those moments, she might find humor. And reflecting on those moments, she might finally see herself for the first time authenticated on mass media because she has never been authenticated on mass media before. And in that moment of reflection, she might find a sense of strength. And in that moment of reflection, she might find a sense of solitude. And in that moment of reflection, she might find a sense of rage. But she will be the author of that image. And by authoring herself online, she will also shape the medium because the image that she will produce will be different from the tropes and conventions that came before her. She may show herself coy and vulnerable and, and proud. She might show her pain, her activism, her eroticism. She might show herself renegotiating these tropes and conventions. But she's always been mediated, so don't call that bad, for there is no such thing as an objective women. There are only authenticated versions of women. And the more women who authenticate themselves online, the more women we will, and the more women we see authenticated online, the more authentic women will become. It's my belief that it, these images will dump paint buckets of vibrant colors on the tame and controlled monochromatic works of the female form in visual culture history. I believe that by authoring these images, the collective trigger fingers of women will wrap around the small aperture of the lens that's controlled the previously restrained possible depictions of the female form in visual culture historically. I think it's possible that your images and my images and everyone's images could force that aperture wide and the light from our authentic self images online could flash onto the film and bleach out those black lines that separated and created the gender binaries in visual culture. And in that brilliant mess, there we will be 
Instagramming ourselves into existence in our bodies, through our bodies, through media, as media, presenting our own objectified, mediated, subjectively embodied, authenticated, and authentic selves. Thank you.